The A10 is done, right? It's being retired. Is it? I hope not. We're going to find out this week here on the Damcasters. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. During my last visit out to Pima in February, Scott Marchand very kindly set up an interview that I'm very excited to be able to share with you. We popped over to Davis Montham Air Force Base to sit down with Colonel Nick Stoli Raduescu. And really, I think it's best to let Stoli tell you what he's in command of, because it's a lot. I am the commander of the 355th Operations Group. Okay. Which is, we have four squadrons under us. So I've really overseeing the A-10 mission here on base at Davis Montham Air Force Base. So 354th Fighter Squadron, the Bulldogs, mm -hmm. they're deployed right now. We have the 357th Fighter Squadron, the mm -hmm. Dragons, that are doing the flying train mi training mission, mm -hmm. so FTU. Uh, and then the 355th Training Squadron, which handles the administrative oversight of the training okay and then the oss the operational support squadron cool um and they take care of the airfield for the base so. okay so as you see stoli is looking after basically all the a10 operations at dm which is essentially the spiritual home of the a10 in the u.s air force throughout this interview we are going to be discussing nick's career his deployments out to the middle east and his command of the 355th which as you heard him say, covers a lot of things. Now, as always, we have to thank our fantastic partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum for continuing to sponsor the podcast, but also for getting us access like this. And of course, if you are a fan of the A-10, they've got a stunning one in the hangar there at Pima. They have got some fantastic stuff coming up across the summer. We spoke last time about the Build a Drone program that they have their Night Wings event coming up as well. And also the Pilot Exploration Summer Camp, where your kids can learn what it takes to become a pilot. That's coming up in June as well. So be sure to head over to www.pimaair.org to find out all the latest. And they're well worth a visit if you're ever in the Tucson area. There is a lot going on, so be sure to check it out. Now, we're going to cover what is coming up with the A-10 in this episode, and it was enlightening to chat to Stoli about what was going on. Now, as we always do with these interviews, we find out why aviation, why somebody's gotten involved in the job they do. And in Nick's case, how does a boy from Romania end up commanding the 355th Operations Group? So, Stoli, how did your career start? Why, why the Air Force, really? Was it sort of always a dream or was it oh, just man. you, you yeah. tripped and fell into it and found yourself? No, I, I totally tripped and fell into it. <laughs> so this was, uh, I don't know if you know, but I'm a, I'm an immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, moved to the United States out of, from Romania in, in 91 when I was, uh, just under 14 and, uh, moved to Michigan, did a couple of years there and then moved to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, finished high school. And my counselor at some point recommended that I go to the air force Academy for a summer scientific seminar. Mm -hmm. And I went to Colorado Springs and I loved it because it's awesome, you know, in the summertime <laughs> especially. And you're like, yeah, yeah I, could, I could do this. Besides, I don't, you know, immigrants didn't, didn't hmm. have a whole bunch of money saved up at that point yeah. in life. So I'm like, yeah, free? Yeah, let's do that. So I went to the Air Force Academy and uh, uh, got into the soaring program at the Academy mm -hmm. and then just started loving flying. And uh, one thing just kind of led to another. I went to pilot training after the academy. Did okay enough to earn a fighter. Did okay after that. Didn't have A-10s as my number one on the list. Ah, uh, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. What, should we ask what was number one on yeah, the list? Yeah, yeah. So I'm very, very happy that it obviously it, it turned out the way it did. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you at the academy, one of my commanders at the time, uh, Major Ty Alexander, now re retired Lieutenant Colonel Ty Alexander, was an AC-130 fire control officer. Mm. So he had quite the uh, stories about his time supporting the, the ground forces, right? So it's, you know, obviously a similar mission to what the A-10 ends up doing uh, from the AC-130 perspective. Uh, and 
he he's quite the character and mm -hmm. uh, definitely got me thinking that air to ground mission is what I want to do when I grow up in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, going to pilot training, I thought the Strike Eagle would be kind of cool because it does that mission mm -hmm. and, and it does some of the other stuff. Um, let's just say that I'm very happy that I ended up with my number two choice, which is the A-10. Because uh, obviously, the, you know, the A-10 has been on the chopping block for a while, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't know how that was going to present itself over my career. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess from a survivability, like self-preservation mentality, mm -hmm. I, I'd put the Strike Eagle number one. We won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good call. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you get the hog, you're through your training, always the two questions is, what was your first flight like? Because of course, it's a pure solo, and then follow up to that, firing the gun for the first time. Yeah, yeah. those are the important questions you have to ask. So I, I don't remember my first flight because I'm sure <laughs> just like the students going through right now, you're, you're terrified and you're like, I just want to make sure I first I start the everything correctly and then I take off and I don't crash and all this stuff. So terrifying, right? So I kind of blocked out that first part of the training mm -hmm. uh, out of my mind, which is the. Uh, TR phase, uh, the transition phase, uh, it, but then the, the first sword, sword issue in the gun is memorable. Right. And uh, it, it's very funny because now we've classified our recording capability and everything, so I can't hand over a tape uh, to the students that are going through the current classes to go, hey man, here's tape of you shooting the gun for the first time. No, I have that tape at home because back then our recording system wasn't classified. And we put it on eight millimeter tapes, and I have an eight millimeter tape that uh, of me shooting the gun the first time. The downside is I don't have an eight millimeter player, <laughs> so I have to. Once I, it's been on the list for retirement at some point. Yeah, just add that to the collection. E e eBay alert for when yeah, one pops up on that, that. For sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. So when when was that? What, what what year? So. so so that was in the fall. A, a young of, chap like yourself, it can't be too far. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fall of 2002 okay. is when I started flying the A-10. So interesting times then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So nearly a year after 9-11, mm -hmm. right? So I was in pilot training when that happened. Just like everybody in our generation remember exactly when that first plane yeah. hit and definitely when the second plane hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was... Definitely graduating A-10 training um, in the spring of 2003, we're watching President Bush mm -hmm. announce the 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom on TV mm -hmm. around my graduation date. So definitely an in interesting time to be <laughs> joining the, active, the operational Air Force at that time. So it wasn't really a case of, I wonder when I'll get deployed. It's, yep. I'm getting deployed. It, oh, yeah. Just be ready to go when yep. the call comes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, leaving here uh, from the training unit here, it was, you're going to go. Just get ready. So do everything you can to get ready. And an interesting thing that we had, my first deployment wasn't actually flying the A-10. All right. So this is a leftover of the Cold War in so many ways, but... Uh, at that time, we still had battalion air liaison officers. Mm -hmm. So again, the A-10 being the, the glue, the connectivity between the, the pointy nose guys and, and the ground pounders, um, one of the requirements for us was to integrate with the Army. Mm -hmm. And we had extra manning in the squadron, so we could still send a few folks to go be BALOs or battalion air liaison officers uh, during your first assignment as an A-10 pilot. So. In 2004, that was my first deployment. It was four months on the ground with the Army guys. Which gives excellent knowledge and feedback for when you're then in the reverse role, providing the cover. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You get fully connected to <laughs> Army mindsets, mentalities, yeah. Army speak. So is it a bit different to Air Force mentality? Yeah, it's, yeah it's a bit different. <laughs> uh, although they still haze their dudes just like uh, all the rest of us. <laughs> Interestingly, so one of the, the first things that the Army unit that I was supporting at the time, they were in Iraq for 
ended up being 15 months oh, wow. during that time. Cool. So I, I went in the middle of that, and I was maybe like the fourth rotation of Balos mm -hmm. that uh, they had seen. So the first thing they wanted to do was make sure that I, I know my place in their hierarchy. <laughs> so they go, hey, Air Force guy, we're going to need you guys to sit guard duty. So at the time, our Air Force footprint with the battalion of 800 infantry dudes was two Romads, uh, enlisted folks mm -hmm. who, you know, took care of the vehicle, took, took care of the radios and everything, and then two JTACs. One officer and one enlisted at the time. So, uh, and we provided 24 7 coverage, air coverage for them. <laughs> so, at the, at the captain level, one thing that was beneficial for me, I'd literally just pinned on captain before I went on that deployment. So, that really helped <laughs> because showing up as a lieutenant, it would have been like over for Murder. me. I would have had no pull. <laughs> but showing up as a captain, I could just stand up and tell him no. Uh, at the captain level, because yeah. I was talking to a, another uh, company commander, and that came across very differently. But we still had to adjudicate it at the battalion mm -hmm. commander level, and uh, the O5, of course, was like, yeah, you're not doing guard duty. You didn't make sure you do your job. <laughs> so it was fascinating. We're here for one specific reason, which is the A-10, but we'll come around to that. I'm interested in the 355th, because it's an interesting interesting organization in that you're training at the moment how many classes have you got left before that starts starts wrapping up because change is afoot change is afoot yeah and yeah so I, I want to get this bit out of the way because this is this is this is the well the sad bit. and honestly I haven't thought about it in the number of classes we think uh, typically the way I you know we process it is yearly training requirement. Mm -hmm. So right now we, we're on the books for producing 36 pilots a mm -hmm. year, um, brand new pilots a year. That doesn't include all the kind of routine retraining yeah. that we do for folks that come back from a staff assignment mm -hmm. or something like that. So we're going to do that until through the end of calendar year 25. Okay. And after that, it's kind of a big unknown at this point. So obviously, the 354th Fighter Squadron, the Ops Unit, mm -hmm. is divesting in fiscal year 24. So by the end of September, they'll be shut down. The rest of it has not been unveiled to the public, but there obviously if there's, it's always been a five-year divestment plan for mm -hmm. the A-10. So we're in the middle of that execution right now. So we kind of expect the training mission here to end uh, sometime in fiscal year 26. Mm. So it's it's an interesting time to, to be to be in command because it's it's a bit of flux for you especially with with your your career on the aircraft as well yeah um, the trainees coming through I guess they're they're eager to get their time on it before before the aircraft is replaced because it's it's one of those aircraft isn't it that yeah is it's unique it has that look that no other aircraft I can think of has yeah. had for a long time so I guess the the guys and girls coming through and the training are, are chomping at the bit to get to get their time on yeah, it. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's quite fascinating because everybody sees the writing on the wall mm -hmm. and they're not dummies when they come to training and they know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm fully transparent with the new students to go, hey, here's the timelines, here's what they, you should expect. Um, but one of the questions that I always ask them is, uh, where, where was the A-10 on your list mm -hmm. uh, when you had to pick it? And it's, it's typically one or two. So, um, and then the next question is the why, yeah. right? So they give the same reason that I, I had when I chose, you know, had A-10 as my number two choice was, hey, we, we believe in the air to ground mission. We think it's relevant. We think it's relevant in the future. This is what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. And if the Air Force will let me do it for a little bit, I'd rather do that than not at all. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's bittersweet knowing that we have so many folks that are still kind of looking at at that. Uh, here's here's another story. We went uh, we took the A10 demo team to the Air Force Academy um, in November of last year, mm -hmm. and we did a, a static display 
at Peterson Air Force Base, which is about 45 minutes, an hour from the academy. And uh, Air Force Academy didn't really, like they advertised that we were out there, but didn't really help out the any of the cadets with like transportation arrangements mm -hmm. or any anything like that. But it was amazing how many people we had show up there, like 300 people probably that showed up. Uh, and we were out there past uh, sunset with flashlights showing the A-10 to cadets who just got off of class, just got off of their athletic requirements, you, you know what I mean? Mm. So uh, late in the day making the pilgrimage out to see the A-10 <laughs> up close and personal. So um, obviously the mission still speaks to people yep. and, and so does the airframe. Which is, you know, chatting to John Boyd last time I was here, um, chatting to Casey Campbell as well. It's, I don't want to say, well, I suppose it is. It's, it's, there's a passion around the aircraft and the mission that just chimes with everybody. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't go away as well. You know, chatting, chatting to John, I asked him about, you know, when he was sneaking around in the dark in his Nighthawk, what he thought about his colleagues doing all the things. He said he was a little bit jealous. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, it's, it is, for, for me as, as an enthusiast and someone who is fascinated by the aircraft and, and the mission, it's great to see that ev even now that hasn't diminished. You've still got, you know, it being one and two on the list of, of the kids coming through wanting to have that opportunity yeah. before the other thing comes along. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the platform is unique the way it was designed, mm -hmm. right? So big wings, um, made to fly fast enough to survive the threats when it was designed, right? Um, and yet slow enough to be able to do what we do in the from a ground perspective, be able be able to affect the ground perspective as much as we do. Um, but obviously, the you know the crowd pleaser is the gun. Yep. So um, the platform is great; it turns phenomenally well. I wish we had better engines, <laughs> uh, but again, that comes down to money. And I think we've been saying we could use better engines since I started flying the A-10, and I'm sure that 20 years before that they were saying we <laughs> wish we had better engines. Um, that would slightly improve the survivability of the A-10 if, if that's ever something that uh, we need to do, but um, you know, there was never enough money to do it. As the Colonel, how often do you get to go flying? So I'm assuming the, the day job is, is pretty busy keeping all of this ticking along. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I tr you have to be on the line. Yeah. You have to get out there and, and fly, and not just for your own sanity, but uh, also <laughs> for the credibility yep. of you know the ops group commander, because uh, if, I, if I didn't do that. So I, I get out there as much as they let me. Um, I try, so our basic mission qualification number is five times a month, so I, I typically make my five. Um, uh, again, I think that's important, yep. um, and it's it's also good for the soul. Yes. <laughs> so, so how let's because it's been eminently adaptable yep. over the past fifty years. In your time on the aircraft, how has it changed? Yeah. Because you know, from from say your first deployment to what what your trainees are, are going through at the moment. Yeah. So lo lots of changes. In, in fact, I think I may have been the last class that flew an A ten without a GPS in it. So we still had INS only jets. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that was a game changer having yep. the GPS capability uh, because you it allowed you to not fully depend on reading a map to mm -hmm. figure out where you are. Because at some point, the INS drift would be uh, too large to keep you in yep. tight areas. Um, so right. that was greatly a, increases your workload in the cockpit. Right. Yeah. It just it puts the focus on navigation and keep awareness of outside the, the cockpit, uh, which is not a bad thing, um, but it, it just lets you to focus on something else. So that was through the training. And then when I got to my first ops unit in the 75th Fighter Squadron with, with KC, um, we just started getting the targeting pod uh, upgrades. And we had 
I want to say four targeting pods in the entire squadron. So we kind of rotated those around and then we had an upgrade list and you kind of hoped that you would be uh, you know, on the list to upgrade to the targeting pod. And honestly, I didn't get my targeting pod to upgrade until I was deployed already. So I have a fascinating story on my target. It was, yeah, I'm number two with the weapons officer, Rage Donnelly, uh, and I have the targeting pod because we didn't have enough. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have one. We get rolled to a troops in contact situation in northeast Afghanistan as it's getting dark, below the weather, and I, I'm on my upgrade, so I'm trying to use the targeting pod and put put the IR sparkle on the ground so he can strafe. And uh, yeah, that, that that's a hell of a story. So that's that was the early stages of getting the targeting pod. Um, how how was that coordination working with with him without the pod? You doing all the extra bits for him. Yeah, yeah. so I was more of the sensor at that point mm -hmm. and trying to figure out and how to mark the target, identify the target, that kind of stuff. And then he was more of the shooter. Um, although we have, you know, the capability to mark and strafe at the same yeah. time. So uh, we try to do that. Uh, that's another good story. My first combat trigger pull, we had a malfunction with the aircraft where I had to usually get a ready light that says the gun's ready to shoot. I pulled the trigger and nothing happened, which is highly unusual in the A-10. But when we were put, they're swapping out the targeting pod, the circuit breaker for the gun was right next to the targeting pod circuit breaker, <laughs> and they had pulled both of those. Oh, no. So I had a good indication, but the gun didn't actually spin. <laughs> so that was uh, very devastating for my first strafe to actually not have anything come out of the jet. Okay, so the flip side of that is, what did they say to you when you got back and you had to tell them that? S Sorry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was, you know, I, my flight lead was, was disappointed that I didn't get that experience. Uh, I, I was mad, he was mad, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's just an honest mistake and uh, you just move on and <laughs> chalk that in the category of, Here's a good story for later. So there I was. Yeah, there yeah. I was, shooting the gun, nothing coming out of it. Yeah. I, I, I think I can just about picture your face in, in your in your. Well, I, I mean, so the, <laughs> and again, this is not what we teach it, and I knew that, but I pull the trigger and nothing happens, and then I let go, and I'm like, I must have not pulled the trigger, so I pull the trigger again, <laughs> and nothing happens, and I'm like, Ah, very mad. So pulling off target. Over those deployments, I'm guessing you're getting lots of things. I remember Casey talking about the uh, SAM warning systems that came in later. Yeah. The, the constantly getting new things come on the aircraft, which must have been reassuring. But also, how do you, when you're deployed, flying that level of missions? How do you get the time to start integrating that into your processes and things? Or is it just, we've got a new toy, let's use it as much as we can? Yeah, I mean... Um, toy in the... Wild, yeah, wild abso sense absolutely, it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, the new capabilities on the jet, um, we pushed for them as yeah. a community. So it's not like somebody out there decided to do this. We would push for it because we saw a need for it. Yeah. So... Um, Initially, you know, like really the biggest improvements happened in the A-10 in the 2000s and after 2010, mm -hmm. things kind of slowed down a little bit. Now we, we've been able to incorporate new weapons along the way, but um, yeah, the C model was obviously a huge improvement, mm -hmm. right? So uh, getting to use that platform, ability to, to drop JDAMs was... Um, significant you know before that we were limited to gbu 12s the laser guided bombs but if you're above the weather and can't get below the weather the that jdm brings a lot of capability uh that we didn't have before so that just allows us to be in uh in more engagements than previously mm -hmm. uh and then yeah the missile warning system uh that's on the jet now came came about at the same time and uh great capability haven't really had a had a need to use it really, mm -hmm. so um, it, it's it's been just 
the permissive environment that we've been, uh, yep. you know, engaged in, it we just haven't really needed it. But it's there and it, it works. And uh, for example, the the hit that took Casey out probably wouldn't have happened if we had the missile warning system. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the impetus. Her specific event, the unobserved kind of either main pad or SA-13, mm -hmm. whatever took her took her out. Um, you know, like that could, that wouldn't happen today with yeah. the attempt because even though you wouldn't see it, the jet would and it would react for you. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Yes. And I guess one one of my other questions was about that permissive environment. It's, I suppose, Afghanistan being rugged country, you're having to get in tight. We, I chatted to, to Mike Kusick last time who was on the Marcus Luttrell rescue as yeah. crew chief. Yeah, they had A-10s over top. Your aircraft, your crews have become a fixture yeah. through this through this period. and. You know, the, you, you've got the flashy stories of oh, the B1s doing close support as well and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. It's S sore subject in light of recent <laughs> media. Yes, I did notice there's a couple less sitting outside than there were last time I was here. But yeah. um, that's, that's a different podcast. Um, did the mission evolve any? And by that, I mean the, the approach to supporting, um, supporting the, the troops in contact as the conflict ebbed and flowed ebbed and flowed because from following it on the outside it would be you know especially especially being in England you'd have regular flashpoints in, in Hellman mm -hmm. and things like that but for, for you on the deployments out there over those many years how much did it change because I think we, we we mentioned how many times did you get deployed yeah four yeah. times yeah. flying the A-10 yeah. yeah last one was quite a bit ago 2011 yeah. uh, and then I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Korea as well, so that that's another side of the A-10. Yes, uh, that was that was. We'll get to that one, but I was just wondering about over those those deployments. Yeah. So what what was the flex? Because I guess you sort of go out thinking, oh, I've been here, I've done this, I'm ready to go, and then it's it's a new environment. Yeah, it, it definitely changed. So uh, three of my four deployments were out of Bagram, and then mm -hmm. one was out of Kandahar. Okay. So very very different environment, right? So, um, and honestly, the one out of Kandahar in 2011 was by far the busiest. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it because of my availability to fly based on my other job at that time. So I was always flying in kind of the hot lines, mm -hmm. uh, late afternoon, closer to sunset. That's when, that's when uh, all the crazies come out. So uh, it's, it's a, for good reason, you know, um, it's a challenging environment to fly at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, as the day to night transition happens, and uh, there, there's a lot of opportunities for the for the bad guys to to do their, their things, maybe less observed than they would be, in w whether it's full night or full right. day. But yeah, uh, Bagram first deployment in 2005. It was largely quiet. There's not really a whole lot going on. Mm -hmm. Our tasking was, hey, you get east, the eastern half of Afghanistan. Like, go fly as a two ship and just fly around and fly some routes, fly overhead for some election support routes, uh, make some noise, let people know that you're there. That that was a lot of what we did. In fact, I only employed three times on that deployment, uh, and first one, nothing happened uh, <laughs> w with my gun. And then later on, as we got closer to the summertime, is when it got hotter. And that that's, you know, the deployed with the 75th. The 74th came in and replaced us. And they were overhead when the Marcus Luttrell yep. thing happened that summer in 05. So, um, yeah, the, the mission changed. I would say our focus became more and more on the scalpel-like accuracy and precision mm -hmm. uh, engagements. So a lot of engagement with the special operations forces and the different task forces around. Mm -hmm. um, when they wanted somebody taken out, uh, we needed to be there and be there quickly, ready to engage. And obviously the, the A-10 is, is uh, pretty good at that. Um, on the conventional side, I would say the focus 
what I observed was a lot of, um, well, we could engage this with Army assets or we could risk friendly forces to go after this event, but we have air power, so we're going to use air power instead. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the conversations that we're having with the JTACs was, uh, hey, com confirming that, you know, this is ground commander's intent. Mm -hmm. We had to kind of make sure everybody's following the ROEs and the spins. Because we, we knew that every every airman has a strategic impact, especially when you can pull the trigger and yep. press the pickle button and, and release weapons on, on the enemy. So, and, and one of the things that we prided ourselves on was uh, the not the things that we did because those are known, but the things that we we stopped from happening. Yep. Whether it's civilian casualties or friendly fires, you know what I mean? Like... That to me is more re rewarding in some ways because you you know that you stopped maybe not the right people yep. getting getting hit. So uh, I shouldn't say more rewarding. It's just as rewarding as the times where you employ and you're like, yeah, those are bad guys. They're gonna die. We take care of that problem. That's almost the easy answer. The hard thing is to go. I don't know. Yeah. So the application of force and then the application of a show of force. Yeah, sometimes the, the ROE is met from a ground perspective, but uh, one of the reasons that we have a, a thinking pilot in the cockpit mm -hmm. is because you, you have an awareness of the situation at large yeah. that may or may not drive the use of force. And, you know, you're the last kind of check before weapons come off the jet and hit that target. So you're personal threshold based on all the what you know about those spins and the ROE need to be met as well and we're the enforcers of that and there there's at times where we had to talk people out of using weapons mm -hmm. because it was the right thing to do and again uh, I think we proud pride uh, ourselves as much on that as uh, some of the employments that we had to do and mm -hmm. save people's lives. Korea must be a very different different deployment yeah and Again, interesting region of the world. Lots going on. Yeah. What's it like taking a, a squadron of A-10s out there on a, on a deployment? Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's it's not a deployment for us. It's We're permanently assigned there. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. so we've, we've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I have t two assignments there. So they're, they're remotes is what they're called, one-year assignments for us. Uh, and sometimes you can go, go there for two with a family. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did one of each. Uh, interesting times for both. The first one is uh, when North Korea it, um, blew up their first nuke, did their first nuke test. So that was definitely interesting. Uh, and then fast forward and, you know, 2015 is when I went there for my second one, 15 to 17. And uh, talk about crazy. Um, it, it's just that environment is insane. Uh, and it and it it goes up and down from cold to hot very quickly. Uh, in fact, in 2015, we were at an exercise in Alaska and we got recalled, if you will, because uh, the North Koreans started shooting artillery at the South Koreans across the DMZ. <laughs> so that escalates pretty quickly. And then, for the rest of my time there through 2017. North Korea was launching a missile like every couple of weeks, so yeah. we called it Operation Deny Weekend because from a leadership <laughs> perspective, it seemed like every Friday night they, or Friday afternoon or Saturday morning, they would launch another missile that would lead us to have some kind of meeting so we can figure out what the response is going to be and flexible deterrent options is what we started calling them and uh, obviously run from the highest levels of government and, and we were on the ground like actively providing the response. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a, a busy and interesting time. Yeah. No, nothing worse than a, a weekend ruined. Well, it's, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you have, we had monthly, we had hells and farewells because mm -hmm. the, with the yearly rotation, people are in and out quite often. And uh, multiple Friday afternoon hell and farewells, I get a call, they're like, Everybody, put your beers down, because we're gonna be on, on the on the hook this weekend. So, uh, 
there, there's a lot of times that that happened. Yeah. I suppose we have to have the the what comes next conversation. And do we? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, but I'm sure there's going to be some someone putting in the comments going, "What did you ask about?" Yeah. yeah. The yeah, my my day job, business analyst, spend my time looking at process and 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 things like that. How does you know we googling random the many attempts to replace the A10 over the past mm -hmm. you know, thirty plus years after its initial twenty with the F-35, are you now starting to consider how that changes, changes the mission? Because it's a very different platform. Um, how do you approach, I guess, that early thinking of training and communications between air and ground? Because just not even just saying just looking at it, but the, per the performance of the two aircraft, and I'm guessing it would be a, a model you guys would get would be making it a very very different way of going about your job. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, arguably, we're not executing the same job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at that from some of the stuff that's been in open press about the training that mm -hmm. is being executed in the platforms. I mean, right now the F thirty five rarely does any close air support training, so. Um, that's not what the F-35 is best suited to do. Mm -hmm. It can do it. It loses a bunch of other, other capabilities while it does that, um, is my opinion. But, um, I mean, if you're going to have a 141 replacement, F-16, F-35, similar missions, similar capabilities, Bring in stealth, bring in the electronic warfare capabilities of the Air F-35. Like, that's a that's a great one for one mm -hmm. right there. Um, nobody will argue that the F-35 will ever do CAS the same way as the F uh, as the A-10. Yep. So, uh, I should say nobody knowledgeable will argue that. There's the trailer right there. For the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> it it's it's fascinating because you've you've spent your career on an aircraft that's constantly been announced it's it's not going to be around in, in a in a few years. Yep. For for a career A10 for a career hog driver, what's that been like? Because it's almost annually that there's a report yeah. come out of Congress that okay, it's time to replace it. Yeah. Even even in the middle of the, the deployments during yeah. um, the recent conflict. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, almost from the day of almost from the day of arrived over here, the fast guys were looking at. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know. If we need maybe another NASA person. Like, uh, so when I went to uh, Air Command and Staff College, uh, I had a class where I was next to a Army Aviation Special Ops guy who had orders to the first A-10 Army training class in 1990. Like physical orders to go to that. So that's how long we've been trying to get rid of the A-10. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, it's been tiring. Yeah. So, um, in fact, General Kelly, uh, Commander of Air Combat Command, came in and talked to us last year and, you know, he, he is equating the divestment of the A-10 with the divestment of the F-4 uh, wild weasels right after Desert Storm. Um, he has a good point. Uh, I think institutionally the Air Force is, because of the narrative of we need to divest the A-10 to invest in future capabilities, which you can't argue with if you think China is the fight like our secretary does. Mm -hmm. Um, that argument that the A-10 going away, that emotional attachment to yep. the, that divestment, it really comes back in General Kelly's words that we just want people to say thanks for all the things that we've done in the past, which over the last 20 years, we've had the, hey, we need to get rid of the A-10 publicly, not as much of the 
appreciation for the missions that we've mm -hmm. done. So there, there is a part of that argument, right? Uh, we just want people to acknowledge what, what the platform and the people have done over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, so the public argument is tiring for the community. I'll tell you, like, at the end of the day, in daily operations, we avoid that as much as possible. But as you get older, in my position, I, you know, I have to pay attention to that. And it does get tiring. Um, from a people standpoint, it, it's made it very challenging to be able to predict people's future. Yeah. Uh, we were, for a, until the divestment's actually happening, we always try to put it our, uh, out of our minds and continue to plan like the A-10 was not going away. So now we're in a position where I, it's, it's much harder for me to tell people what they're gonna do in three to five years in the Air Force because they have a bunch of forks that they're coming up to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them comes down to what they wanna do. And honestly, most of the A-10 dudes that I talk to, A, don't wanna leave the mission, uh, interest in the F-35 um, varies across the community, uh, and, and there's not really any other place for them to go do what, from the mission standpoint, what yeah. they've done in the A-10. So that creates a bunch of challenges. There's a lot of people that want to ride it out, go down with the ship, so to, say, so to speak. Um, that creates, presents its own cha challenges from mm -hmm. taking care of people, because you're Ability to give him that predictability is 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 very hard at, at this point, mm. and especially at a time for I guess many of your crews, it's you know it, it's it's career decision time, isn't it? And yeah, uh, yeah, and I would say that that's not a unique A10 perspective right now mm -hmm. or A10 issue. Uh, I would say the fighter force at large mm -hmm. has a significant challenge uh, because. A, the pull from the airlines, mm -hmm. um, which the pay is like two or three times as much as you get flying the A-10, but you can't fly the A-10 or the F-16 or the F-35 uh, in the civilian side. So um, there's, there's the pros and cons. At some point, a lot of people do, hey, I've done my time, I've enjoyed that. If I can do it in the Garden Reserve, on a part-time duty, I'd lo love to continue doing that, but I'm gonna go in a different direction. So where it hurts us on the active duty side is uh, we, we, are, we are challenged finding uh, people that uh, wanna stay in for a career at this point. Looking back at your career, when someone, you tell someone, oh, I'm a hog pilot. Yeah. What's the moment that pops into your head that defines for you and your career flying the A-10? Uh, I, is, 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 is there a lot of them or just is there something yeah, that makes the, you smile? I mean, there's a lot of them, but obviously some of them rise to the top. So there, you know, a lot of, a few combat stories. Uh, it's interesting because I'm not the guy who sits down and writes down, captures all the histories. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm just not very good at that. But I, I look back at a few uh, instances that were very um, defining, if you will. So here's one. In 2011, uh, we're flying out of Kandahar and we launch. And as soon as we launch, we get uh, retasked to a troops in contact situation. Uh, and, it, and that in training, a lot of times we simulate um, close without a, or sorry, cast without a uh, qualified JTAC. Mm -hmm. And the way we usually do it is, you know, you start off with a JTAC and then the JTAC takes a hit and then he has to go off the radio. That literally happened to me on this troops in contact. Mm -hmm. So we had a Marine JTAC who, uh, his interpreter right next to him stepped on an IED and I got three radio calls from this JTAC when I checked in with him. We took an ID hit, I'm peppered with shrapnel. That was the first call. The second call is, I'm bleeding, I, I need to get some stuff handled, I'll call you back. And the third one is, bring in the medevac, I'm going off the radio. So those are the three calls that I got. 
That was a, it was an IED. They weren't actively taking fire, so there wasn't much I could do from, uh, or we could do as a flight from a taking care of the team on the ground. But what we were able to do was we, we called in for the medevac bird. We escorted the medevac bird in. We pushed them around some known trouble areas and we brought them into the landing zone, right? So we were able to get get that JTAC uh, medevac out of there. And I talked to him a couple of days later on the phone. So that, you know, uh, very rewarding from that standpoint. So that was the first half of that sortie. And then the second half, another troops in contact. Uh, so the first one was uh, north of Hel Helmand. Uh, and then the, the second one, second half of that sortie was north of Kandahar. Uh, totally what you would not expect from Afghanistan. Very lush, right around the rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, very dense vegetation. Uh, heavily populated for Afghanistan uh, there. And it was an army unit that was taking contact. And we had, over time, that summer, we had come to an arrangement with the JTACs as everybody built proficiency, they wanted weapons hitting the ground within three minutes of checking in uh, because outside of that timeline, they lost their ability because the, the bad guys would take pop shots and run away, relocate, take some more pop shots. So if you didn't get that, those fires as quickly as you could, um, your ability to actually hit the bad guys diminished mm -hmm. and now you're just putting down more suppression fires than anything else but you know we had worked our processes to the point where we checked in and we like inside of three minutes i'm doing a low low long range strafe pass with friendly smoke in the hud and i'm strafing like 60 meters away from the friendly position uh, in densely vegetated areas, uh, yeah. So that was that was quite the sortie because a the JTAC initially, hey, I'm going off the radio, I'm I'm bleeding out type of stuff, followed by the troops in contact. Like that was the closest I've I've strafed to friendly positions. So uh, yeah, that was definitely a memorable sortie. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> all in one sortie. Yeah, it's fascinating. Colonel, this has been fantastic. Thank you for taking the time to, to sit down and, and have a chat with us. And um, you, you know, the, the phone's been ringing and you've been very, very kindly ignoring it with, with uh, the exercises going on. So thank you so much for joining us on the pod. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. Thank Appreciate you. it. Cheers. Take care. I cannot thank Colonel Nick Stoley Raduescu enough for joining us here on the Damcasters and being as candid as he was and answering all of my stupid questions as we do. And also to Captain Goldtoe as well, Derek Fowler, who took his career in his hands for being my escort around DM. So thank you for that, sir. Very kind. I love the A-10. I think it is one of those truly unique aircraft that you can almost call irreplaceable. And it is proving so as the aircraft continues to do fine service for the United States Air Force to this day and in many theaters being deployed out to the Pacific and elsewhere constantly with the current interesting geopolitical situations we have at the moment. So to hear that there are still classes going through and people still putting it at the top of their list is wonderful and reassuring that the, the hog might be around for a bit longer. F-35, we're going to talk about that in an upcoming episode as well. So do stick around for that. As always, thank you for your continued support. Like, subscribe, do all that great stuff. Stick some stars in your podcast app of choice if you do the audio version of this as well. And if you fancy becoming a damn Kestier, getting these episodes early, different wafflings at the beginning and end from me, check us out on Patreon. And that all starts from just £3 a month. And we're going to do some fun stuff over the summer, maybe some movie things as well, because it's England in the summer, which means it's going to be raining and I'm going to be stuck inside. So there's that. As always, thank you so much for your continued support. It really does mean the world to me. This is a lot of fun to be able to produce this for you. Let me know what you think in the comments. Leave a review as well. Thank you. And until next time, do take care of yourselves.
Bye-bye. The Damn Casters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamncasterspod.com.